Hello and welcome to a new video in the series of the world beyond the ice walls. You have given me a lot of support for the series so I'm continuing it and I'm going forward with the episodes. We have done three more videos on this series but I recommend watching if you're new to this and if you haven't watched it yet then you can watch them by clicking the links in the description down below where you will be able to actually see and hear about the three parts we did already. As you can see by this map, you can see the Antarctica itself, which is an ice wall that literally um, literally rounds up the entire world, is being split by different gates that are being able to transport the people inside the old world into a new world made out of the continents in the ice walls new territory. In this case, we have the four gates, the Serpent's Gate, the Tiger's Gate, the Sentinel's Gate, and finally the Leviathan's Gate, which of these we have covered the first three in the first three videos, and we have covered much of the land masses in the second ring, or the first ring in this case. We have covered the continent of Thoth, we have covered the continent of Atem, we have covered the continents or the archipelago of Xenonesia, so the Blemie, the people of all these different kinds, the leprechauns, goblins, gnomes, dwarves, goblins. We have covered all the people coming from old Carthage, new Carthage. We have covered the old Vikings coming from uh, the Scandinavian Peninsula. And today we will be doing multiple things. So first of all, I've been asked to review something that I've not mentioned yet of this world, which is a kind of philosophical thought that is behind it, and it is the thought of Holvenism. So one thing you can see by the map of this world is that historically the territories are a bit different, so you can see things like the European lands being different with things like the French Empire maintaining its prominence all the way up to more years. So you can really, really see that the French Empire owns most of, uh, like, it owns all of France proper, plus it owns multiple territories in Europe itself and even vassalizes basically all of Germany and probably has a lot of control over many more parts. And of course, being the fact that it was one of the major explorers beyond the ice walls, it has a lot of colonies even in the first and second rings, as was showed by all these multiple entries we, re we read in the previous episodes, like all these blue things are owned by France in the continent of Atem, they enslave populations, bring their own populations to these territories and continue a circle of enslavement and um, oppression of the local peoples that inhabit the territories beyond the as walls, they even co have colonies into uh, the multiple archipelagos and things and uh, of course they even have colonies in uh, the rest of the world. But that said, we know that the French have been uh, um, particularly fortunate when it comes to their colonial endeavors in this world and things like the French earning their footing on uh, Europe also has to do with the philosophy of the fact that the third emperor or I mean the second emperor of French after Napoleon is his son, Napoleon II, which in history as we know it died when he was too young to actually rule and he never actually made it to the throne because his father was deposed and Napoleon was sent to St. Helena Island right here. But in this case his son Napoleon actually did make it and with the entire story of the Beyond the Ice Walls territories of course the entire history is changed. The philosophy of Holvenism is a philosophy that in this world spawns from the French Revolution, but it actually existed all the way back into the times of early Christianity and even before. Holvenism is the wind beneath the eagle's wings. During the first century AD, while Christianity was beginning to rise to prominence, an ancient movement would emerge from the shadow of antiquity. It would come to be known as Holvenism, a mystery cult centered around their enigmatic prophet, Holven of Alexandria, an Egyptian scholar and historian who interpreted the driving force of human history as having three parts. The world spirit, God, the state spirit, great man, the age spirit, the everyman. In the early years, they faced persecution from the Jews, Romans, pagans, and then the Christians, who they hated the most. The Holvenists returned to the shadows, continuing to secretly practice their faith in fringe communities around the Balkans and England. 
During the 17th century, an influential crypto hovenist produced a morality play disguised as Christian tale, the titled The Everyman. In its time, it was beloved by the messianic masses, but to those in the know, it was a scathing critique of Christianity and the concept of centering one's morality on God. Only a few people had heard his original story. It was misinterpreted and poorly translated from Middle English. During the Protestant Reformation, the Holbinists emerged from the woodwork in various German provinces as groups dedicated to dissuading peasant revolts against both Protestant and Catholic through propagandist misinformation. At first, they were seen as just another reformation movement that sought to restore peace, but this would all change after they were outed for being behind the attempted assassination of the Pope himself. That event would bring about a massive purge of Holvinists across most of Catholic-held Europe, where most of them resided. Those who survived allied themselves with the Calvinist House of Bourbon in France, which would turn on them after capturing Paris and reverting to Catholicism, once again slaughtering the majority of remaining Holvinists and forcing the rest into hiding. They would remain mainly in around Paris, where they rested until the French Revolution inspired them to return to action once more. They identified with the Robespierre's cults of the supreme being and ingrained themselves in the elite circles behind the Napoleonic dynasty. The cult would persist for the coup of Napoleon and venerate him as a great man who led them to achieve their ideal of Terridor or the Golden Land. Similarly to the 19th century German philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, the Holvinists believe that the state shall facilitate a great golden age, as it is the natural manifestation of collective humanity. Their main goal is to establish a one world government where they can achieve their golden land ideal, beginning with the population of France. The world's. And so, this is basically the entire story of the Holvinists in the history of Europe and the world, so they can, you can see how much influence the Holvinists actually have, since they controlled France and France is victorious in the Napoleonic Wars, and of course, apart from that, they have colonies all around the world itself and of course the lands beyond the ice walls. So they have, they have colonies in Thoth, they have colonies in Aten, they have colonies all around the world, and of course their influence is everywhere, as the literal emperor of France. Napoleon II is himself probably a secret or maybe even open Holvinist, which, you know, already makes it something that you should be afraid of. Now, let's actually see to the philosophies themselves of the Holvinist faith, I mean, of the Holvinist philosophy more likely. Let's start by the world spirit. The Holvinists believe that God, the principal being, created the universe only to sit on his laurels, not wanting to reinterpret himself. Then, a spirit named Reason, commonly interpreted by Christians as Lucifer, came down from the heavens and created life and humanity to defy God's complacency. The actions of a Reason angered God, who sought to dissipate him, but the trickster spirit was quick and hid himself to the soul of the first man, who began to interpret God. Defenseless against this act of will, God could only sit and watch, casting his resentful glare at mankind forever, never forgiving him for his act of free will. The Holvinists hated Christianity due to their proclamation of Christ being the Son of God. The Holvinists believed that Jesus of Nazareth to be a direct rival, and their primary goal was to help since had been to subdue and undermine the Christian belief system. They failed horribly until the 18th century, with Robespierre leading their newly reinvigorated movement. If you don't know who Robespierre was, he was a major revolutionary in the French Revolutionary Wars, and of course when the French Revolution first kicked off, he was one of the people that most wanted France to change from being a Catholic and Christian monarchy to becoming a French and atheist or least not definitely atheist, but you know, a secular republic. The fact that Robespierre himself, he is a convinced Hovenist and he supports this anti-God anti and anti-religious um, meaning and uh, ideology. Let's get to the state spirit. 
A core aspect of Holiness beliefs is that when the first man had children, reason divided his spirit among the souls of the descendants to allow mankind to continue spitting, spiting God. However, the spirit became less potent with each division, so the children of the first man would only become more ignorant as their numbers increased. The Holvinists believed that a unity of will was the cure for this decline, that when a state of tribe grew, so did its capacity for a reason. They would interpret through history a cyclical or dialectic system, where a series of great men would rise to prominence, embodying the state spirit of their nation only to fall from grace and time and time again. Wielding the might of collective reason, the state spirit is the leading force and vision, pushing humanity toward a utopian society that awaits in the distant future, where the golden super superman, sup yeah, superman write poetry with eternal heroic virtue. So already you can see some kind of uh, supremacist kind of view views that the man should be in complete control of the world in at all time and defy God at any point. Already you can see how they use the state for it. Already you can see how they think the man, man himself was like in like in accord with Lucifer or how they call it reason. So you can already see what's going on here. Then we have the age spirit. The superior evolution of great man or a or state spirit is the everyman. The everyman is a manifestation of every man, every will, every mind, and every soul. It is the force of reason incarnate, first conjured by Hoven during a psycho psilocybin binge on the Nile. The everyman operates like Christian Holy Spirit, where it is a representation of communal energies, the residual echoes of the unified spirit, depicted as multi-part humanoid with five faces and five bodies, wings, a sinful stomach, a great talisman of thought. The everyman is an archetypal symbol that most modern Hovenists believe to be merely a metaphor. In actuality, the everyman is a hidden, ethereal entity that exerts influence over the followers of Hovenism, and attempts to usher in a new world order for its mysterious masters who have tormented it into submission. This is crazy. So this is actually like the actual how it looks. And that is why it's in chain that the Napoleon II, the son of Napoleon, actually holds around his neck. Remember, this is the guy that rules France, probably the strongest country in Europe, and one that actually rules more nations in Europe and has colonies all around Europe and all around the world, and of course even out of the main center police, even out of the ice walls. So it's an incredibly... Uh, it's an incredibly influential ideology and thought Holdenism for a country leader like uh, Napoleon II to hold and of course for his men to believe in it and of course the re revolutionary France appears to have fallen to this thought. I don't know whether the Empire of France, so when the Napoleonic dynasty came into power, they continued just as much to believe in these things because there will be, be uh, enormous troubles with the church but the non-existence of the papal states and the non-mention of the Pope in any kind and regard, I do believe that the Pope was eliminated at some point by the French to make a street for their Holvenist ideology, while in reality the Pope managed to return but has not managed yet to create a new papal state, which is why they have the Vatican City. Next, let's get to actual continents and lands that we have to get. So I want to cover some lands that are far in the south. I usually cover lands near a new gate for every video, but this time since I was focusing on the Holvenist ideology, I wanted to cover something that is more far away from what we actually normally cover, something even more far away than the actual first ring, because of course, let's say it in geography terms. This is the world as we know it. This is the ice walls, or Antarctica, call it as you may. These are the gates that surround it, and, well, I mean, sorry, that the gates that intersect it, and there is a first ring delimited by a red circle that goes all around it where some continents and lands lie, actually the majority of them, but there are some lands that are actually after this red circle, and they consider themselves the lands in the second ring, or at least that's what I consider them. So, 
I wanted to cover today the Avalon's Min and Nevis, Lands of Deception. So I'm going to start by Min and Nevis, the Lands of Deception. This region, comprising a vast peninsula sticking out of the mountain ring and the continent neighboring it, does all it can to earn its moniker as the land of deception. Camouflage and mimicry have become the evolutionary focus of the wildlife living here. The chameleons of the first world are nothing to the trickery afoot here. The animals try to look like plants, the plants try to look like animals, living beings of every kingdom have adopted the ability to change color and shape all to defeat the erstwhile biological rivals. The native life has had millions of years to perfect its defenses to the point that even humans have a very hard time seeing through them. Exasperated maddened explorers have old tales of landscapes itself shifting distance and size before their eyes, as if the entire country had been shaped by a divine trickster. Basically, they're in the walls. But in other words, the, even the shape of the land is mysterious. As you can see, it's not even only in the island, in these islands, but it's even part of this mysterious continent, what appears to be another continent. But how can there be another continent? Is a continent that literally encompasses the entire world? Is this just a hollow earth inside another earth? Well, I have to continue reading to learn. So, let's get to... Hmm... I'm curious of what I should read for first. There is an A here. This territory here in the center of the islands. Let's see what it is about. Bas Picoposic of Constantinia. When the Spanish took control of the Ottoman territory now called Nueva Menorca, which is these islands here, a large number of zealous Turks rejected the government that had imposed themselves on the island and fled into the wilderness where they would fight valiantly to protect their Islamic society free of Christian suzerainty. Unable to wrest the territory from, their militarily, from them militarily, the Spanish forces sought an alternative means of breaking the rebel spirits. They procured a large number of mind-altering substances, exposed to captured Turkish soldiers to them, and through the power of suggestion led them to hallucinate visions of angels and Christian iconography. The soldiers would be allowed to return home, with no memory of ever being captured, believing that they were, they were prevented from attacking the Spanish by messengers from heaven who proclaimed the truth of Christianity and ordered them to turn back. The Turkish resistance was thrown into disarray, as one by one soldiers would arrive at rebel camps telling the same story, leading to an immense turmoil and mental anguish among the ranks. As the numbers of young men losing faith in their cause grew, the bulk of the remaining faithful forces became increasingly desperate, rallying for a final stand among, against the Spanish scoundrels. The Spanish were made aware of this oncoming attack, enlisting the help of strange mystics from Avalons, who prepared a ritual involving the large-scale dispersal of hallucinogens to demoralize the attackers before the battle ever started. What the, myth, what the mystic knew and this employer didn't was that by invoking the same image over and over again through their brainwashing, they had been attracting a powerful ethereal entity seeking to assume the role of the angel conjuring the soldiers' minds. On the day of the battle, the drugs were released and the ritual was initiated, causing the entity to appear over the battlefield, successfully causing the Turks to immediately convert, but also blinding every one of the Spanish authorities who hadn't been exposed to the substances necessary to perceive such a thing. The Turks Turks took Saint's event not only as proof that the Christianity was true, but also that the Spanish had been forsaken by God, and they continued to live independently, more radical in their new faith than they were ever, ever before. So the Bas Baspiscoposic of Constantinia is some ethereal realm where the Turk population that literally or originally settled in Nueva Menorca came to be after they were expelled by the Spanish, they retreated in the inner lands think, thinking they would be safe. When the Spanish came to them, they tried to brainwash them with basically drugs, 
or at least uh, you mean kind of like mushrooms stuff like that or potions and instead of working to their ben um, to their behalf they would yes convert them to christianity through some kind of brainwashing but they didn't manage to convert them into the spanish cause which would end up with a battle and finally with the end of their lives and for the start of the new Turkish state, a Christian Turkish state in the lands of deception of Min and Nevis. Then we have the Isola Mascherata, post-Venetian, 1 50th the size of Nueva Menorca but with 10 times the GDP, mostly through exploiting their neighbor and buying out all their businesses. So all the way next to Nueva Menorca, which is an ex-Spanish colony, an economic punching bag, we have the Isola Mascherata. For those that don't know, the Venetians, which in this timeline were around for a lot of while, or at least they remained uh, relevant for more time, did actually try colonizing multiple regions and did time kind of create their own realms everywhere. Venetians are the people in this area of Italy, of course, in case you didn't know. They did create areas like uh, Ghiaccio Splendente, an Italian colony. They had, uh, they had the colonies in Xenonesia, they had colonies even here in Thoth and so on and so forth. So they even um, went to the lands of uh, deception to create some colonies, but they were dwarfed by the size of Nueva Menorca, the Spanish colony, yet still they managed to become the one which was richer because of all the tragic embarkments of the Spanish colonial empire and of course the fact that Venice ended up not being remaining alive and Italy took over them, or at least the French did through them, and then eventually the old Venetian colonies would become somewhat independent somewhat not maybe i don't know then we have the boss Re boss rare Repub no wait the boss republic the descendants of stranded afrikaners and cape colors quite inbred and big on swamp magics so this is this another internal territory which actually borders the one we saw of the babispos cape of constantinia and in this case it's made out of the people coming from south africa the long oppressed and mistrust Protestant minority finally got their wished for autonomous territory to call their own. After years of persistent requests with the assurance that their people would remain unwillingly loyal to the French crown, the government eventually greenlit the settlement, mostly to end the constant annoyance and cleanse the motherland of their Protestant taints. The Huguenots now spent more of their, most of their free time plotting their eventual rebellion. So you can already see how they aren't really happy behind the French power. Then we have Nouvelle Acadie. So Acadia is where it was a part of Canada. It was this part of Canada, but then they expelled the French speaking people in this area and most of them went to Louisiana, but in this case, a lot of them went to Nouvelle Acadie all the way here in Mines and Nevis. When the British expelled Acadians, oh, okay, I already said it. Dent the Dragon, base of French naval activity in Min and Nevis with a truly formidable fleet stationed here, constantly building new ships because they keep drifting away when no one is looking. So this explains the last of the colony in the major island. I'm going to assume Mainz and Nevis means like this and this, so probably what we covered is Nevis, but I'm not sure, I might be wrong. Anyways, let's cover... Okay, so these are the things we already covered. I'm not going to seek these. Okay, so let's see Lyonnais. The Isles of a Thousand Coves. One could say that the ultimate spire is paradise. These islands are abundant with secluded cloves. <laughs> Fuck. What is it? These islands are abundant with secluded coves and easy to miss caverns. Most of these open to onto the sea and have been a port of warm of all for my Neptunian pirates over the years, but some of hosts in scientifically unique wildlife or attract other outcasts by virtue of their defensibility and seclusion. Lioness's continental shell follows the graves of countless betrayed pirateers and would-be pirate hunters. So there are some multiple island archipelago here, uh, basically stretching all the way from the Scandinavian colonies to the end of, Ki of Cape Tudor. So we have New Nsas, conquered for the crown by a British-educated Ashanti prince who became a pirate and got to choose the name much to the annoyance of the Brits. So it's a, an African-led but British-governed colony in 
Leoness. Then we have New Tortuga, a private, a private republic allied with the British, whose presence in this region is mostly focused on giving the French as much hardships as possible to keep them from expanding any farther west. Then we have unclaimed territory of various pirates, I would have argued probably we would have been part of this major Portuguese colony or ex-Portuguese colony, but it doesn't appear to be the case. Then we have the, the New Azores, which are these, originally Portuguese, okay, so this confirms that this territory was actually Portuguese, by the way, but fell into British hands of British, as British settlers kept arriving in the New Azores, thinking it was Cape Tudor, and the Portuguese settlers kept arriving in Costa dos Targartos, thinking it was Nova Azores. So they kind of confuse the two lands. Of course, once again, the lands of deception makes it extremely hard for the most of the people to understand what is actually going on here. So things like the ships coming to another part of the land is kind of common. Then we have Cape Tudor. According to the inhabitants, Edward the Sixth of England did not die at 15, but was instead forced into hiding by his wicked sisters. His line continuing the shuttles until they moved here to continue their dynasty openly and make their claim to the throne of fish. This is pretty interesting, so it diverts the, the crown lands of the British Empire into different parts. So then we have Trompeia, this huge colony here in this what appears to be like the northern part of this huge landmass. Land here given as a word to retired spies. While officially retired, many of the landowners are well aware that it's no coincidence that they were settled in a region plagued by British sabotage and subterfuge. Interesting, interesting. Then we have Wild Linie, Scandinavia. All this land here is claimed by Scandinavia, yet, as you can see, only some parts of it are actually settled. Seems like the Nords bit off a bit more than they could chew here, will likely end up some selling to another country. And of course, if you don't know, Scandinavia is actually a United States. It's not three different or four different countries, it's a union of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, and Greenland, but I wouldn't, wouldn't count that one because it's probably just a, a territory. This is, it doesn't have any people there, or not enough. We have Sorf. Jordan, which is actually one of the southernmost territories in the entire Ice Walls. It's like the third most southern ones, with Ojigia and this red territory here being only the only ones that are more southern than that. Sword, Sword Fjorden is the fjords and temperatures forests were perfect for the Scandinavians, bringing in a great number of settlers to the point that it looks a bit like it's been inhabited for centuries. It helps with the settlers would often get lost when trying to reach the already settled fjords, to the point where they would always give up and settle in whatever fjord they would find themselves in. That is actually pretty interesting. Then we have the explanation. You may be wondering regarding the peninsula and the island. Which is Min and which is Nevis? Oh, this was actually what I was trying to figure out before, but I didn't, I didn't know. It depends on who you ask. Half of the world sees it one way, half of the world says the opposite. It all began with an error a messenger made when the hand copying the reports of the explorers who discovered the lands and named the landmasses. The explorers all died at sea soon after, so they could never clarify which names were correct. Of course, the English and the French ended up receiving the popularizing conflicting names for the regions, and have been too prideful to budge at their official stances on the matter. The state of affairs has confused travelers for generations. Generations. Now many simply default for, to, to saying the peninsula of Minam Nevis and the island of Minam Nevis. Kind of like um, St. Kitts and Nevis. Also we have a one last territory hill that is actually inhabited by humans, which is the ex-Ottoman exile colony practicing strange Holvenist influence form of Islam. So we can already see one of the first mentions of Holvenism in the lands beyond the ice walls, in this case, in this very very far away, the almost this most southern territory in the entire, actually I think this might be, uh, let me do something very quick, let me take, um, actually like this, I think this might actually be the southernmost territory in the entirety of the ice gates, I mean the, the land beyond the ice walls. This is crazy. Anyways, it has a different and strange form of Islam, which is actually 
influenced by Hovenism. Known for the production of the hot air balloons and many failed attempts at using them to cross a mountain ring. Uh, so this might be a mountain ring, which would explain some things. The bigger ice walls? I am not sure. It is interesting to theorize though. Hmm. Okay. I am curious to see what's next, but I'm not sure of what to do now. I could go and explain the other ones, or I could go back and explain Antilia. I think I might actually explain Antilia. Domain of the Parasites Upon first glance, the most remarkable features of Antilia's environment would be the sheer density and numerosity of its many small islands. Beaches, swamps and mangroves rippling in and out of water, as plentiful as the waves themselves. Millions of them stretching across the skiscape for over 4,000 miles. Only upon first glance, that is, as this archipelago hosts a far more astonishing and sinister secret. Every single animal that dwells on these lands, from the unmoving crocodilians of the murky waters, to the serpents which forge for fruit in the branches above, to the ants which cover the trees, and the bloodthirsty snakes. Snails? The snails are bloodthirsty? Alright and mow through the ranks, and yes, even the humans, all of them carry this secret within their bodies, a parasite, a most versatile and abundant to be ever found anywhere, one with hundreds upon hundreds of unique, of unique life cycles, stages fitted to the every endemic species and organs within them, one that dominates the ecosystem as much as any civilized race, and as humanity would come to find, holds the potential to dominate the entire world. That is insane. Also, look at the shape of these lands. These are literally ugly. These are like very, very ugly. These look like someone put a can of Pringles, crushed it, and threw everything on a table. This is what it looks like. I, I do not believe land looks like this in normal maps. Either this was made with a very, very, very like short knowledge of how land looks, or, I don't know, maybe it's because of the parasite? Guess we'll have to learn about it. I'm going to be removing the music, I think I've done a lot with the music. Let's start, let's start. Let's see... Hmm... Where the parasite actually comes from. The homemaker form of the Antillian parasites, often the most common and influential form to be contained with the bodies of the carriers, germline parasites will develop into this form upon entering a host, and usually only exist per body. These are responsible for modifying conditions in various parts of the body to be more suitable for development and survival of other parasites, including those specialized to specific organs of the host, as well as the temporary forms as they wait for the proper conditions to move on to the other host. They usually affix themselves on the inside of the digestive organs and implant the host with a network of antennae that spread throughout their body like roots, operating as a collective nervous system for the parasite living within also and intermingling with the host's own cell nervous system. This is actually terrifying because it's not really like imaginary, it is kind of real that these things exist. If you've ever seen those videos where ants, it's like the zombie ants videos, where you would see these ants that are dead and yet they're still moving around because a parasite literally controls every single part of their body. <laughs> it's crazy. Through its antennae roots, coordinating with other parasites and various chemical means, the homemaker can manipulate the behaviors and physicality of the host in many ways. It is the main form responsible for terminal behaviors and post-death chemical messaging. This is what I was talking about, actually. And I'm not sure if it looks like this in usual terms, but it, it might be. I mean, this doesn't really even look, apart from the colors, this doesn't even look that weird for a parasite. When humans are imminently close to death, they, like most host species, are often compelled to position themselves somewhere favorable for the parasites within them. 
the parasites will consume much of the host's body and take on enlarged forms designed to make as much out of the available matter as they can to spread the offspring before the two perish. For some produce bait structures, these are some terrible thoughts. Just read about this. It's actually horrifying. Terribly. Terribly horrifying. I'm going to skip this part. Let's start by looking at some colonies. Pais Puni, infected with parasitism and rejected by the French veteran, the chaotic assortment of independent settlements is just waiting to be raided by pirates. So at least this part doesn't seem too insane. Then we have the Les Eels et Oils a company. It is a ridiculously loyal colonial remnant that considers themselves an official possession of France, even after being largely abandoned since before living memory. They think they are the only 100% parasite-free nation of Antilia, as they are willing to cut off and evacuate the obtained from any territory there where the parasite has spread. Republic of New Leon, a nation of Breton buccaneers firmly within the Mondebarian sphere of influence. Suppression of Catholicism back in France and their newfound insulation has made them rather druidic. They are quite unhappy about this whole quarantine deal, which is why they're content with being among the Bavarian allies, as it has given the illusion of connection to the outside world, but it at least means the French can't chase them all the way to Antilia. Inigoer and Lura, the post-colonial majority Basque nation of Mundaberia, located on Thoth, has, among, has been among the most imperially ambitious emerging nations of the Second Circle. Their success in establishing colonies can be attributed to them picking the most undesirable lands in order to avoid the competition with much more powerful colonial empires based in the colonial world. We actually read this in the last episode. Mundibaria, which is literally in the ends of this um, peninsula of Thoth, is like a, an insanely skilled colonial empire. So this is the second, actually, colonial empire. We mentioned that the, the like, um, Neo-Carthaginians created a colonial empire from the second ring, but apparently the Mundibarians also created a colonial empire. Also, I think I'm going to have to correct myself from earlier. The second ring is this all right the entire thing is the second ring but it is divided in a one part and a second part which is why i call this like the second second ring or like i guess you could call it the third ring but it's it's more like we're missing the actual third ring anyways this is a territory of the Mundabarians. Then we have Zanjistan, a next Ottoman colony born out of Black Slaves Rebellion in the 1600s. The former slaves have thoroughly culturally and genetically intermingled with the local Kawagaula tribes, and their descendants have been renowned as skilled in surviving, trekking, and fighting in jungles and swamps of Antilia. They have been playing both sides of the far Bantich Saint Maras conflict for over a century at this point. And then we have the Republic of Barbanti. So apparently there is like um okay so this is what the there was a lot of references to this conflict between the Forbanti and the Cien Maris. so this uh, I was trying to figure out who these were and apparently here we have the Republic of Forbanti began as a few Venetian ports that established many farms and plantations to resupply visiting ships with foods, as well as cultivate various local crops to sell exclusive luxuries. When the quarantine hit, their abundant food supply allowed them to fare better than most of other colonial nations, being mostly self-sufficient. They have staunchly resisted the Saint Marians for over a century at this point. The Great Hospitaller Priorate of Saint Marais so, the Saint Marans happen to be Christian? I don't know, let's see. The most powerful nation of Antilia by far, and a surprisingly prosperous post colonial Spanish nation, especially so considering the circumstances. Under the leadership of the Peruvian chapter of the Knights of Malta, so already there's a Peruvian chapter of the Knights of Malta? I know about the Knights of Malta, I had never heard about the Peruvian chapter of them. Anyway, they expanded throughout much of Antilia on the merit of having gotten their first 
native non with sending, and have recently taken an active role in increasing the population through capture of ships from the known world, and, and covered the recruitment of settlers from other second circle colonies. Despite being nominally a republic, it has been nominated since its founding by the Torres family, owners of the valuable diamond mines in the country's largest island, La Gran Salada, which is this. The Peruvian knights have evolved into the Holy Order of San Mares, who maintained order in the nation for military force and self-attributed religious authority after being cut off from the Holy See in the Northern world. As I mentioned earlier, the Holy See is not really available for anyone here. Here we have an example, by the way, of golden eyes and white spots on the skin are telltale signs of parasitic infection. Here we have a collection of Kawegala people, which are apparently live in this area here, which is called Kerar. So let's see what Kerar is. An ancient megalithic faced, megalithic city temple complex that has long been seen as a sacred ground to the Kawagawa people. All those who are infected with the parasite find themselves irresistibly compelled to go to the city in their final years of life, where they spend the rest of their days maintaining the complex and ending to the structure. Interesting. So here we see a collection of Kawagawa people. Even after much of them were wiped out by the old war diseases, dozens of distinct ethno-linguistic groups persist throughout the archipelago. Women often adorn themselves with red facial tattoos, while males tend to tattoo out around the chest, arms, and feet. Despite its sacred and forbidden status, many Kawagala people fled to Karar, seeking protection behind its great stone walls. As the colonizers continued to expand their influence, Karar has become the last bastion for Kawagala civilization. Under the guidance of Nipus, elders who live alone in the city centers, the Kawagala have begun to employ foul magics in order to fend off the invaders. Native Sue to Dogs introduced only 1,500 years ago, inherited by a primarily parasite strain from the native flightless birds via predation. The effects of these parasites, which were once specialized for birds, have had another effect on the appearance and behaviors of the suto, including dancing, their two-toned barks, and collecting piles of sticks to build nest-like structures all around places where they can sleep. So these are like some effects of the parasite. Finally, we have the Gyungekus, a native crocodilian displaying a high degree of symbiosis with the parasite, possessing worm-like forms burrowed into their faces and backs. Their primary function of, for the Gyungekus is to act as lures for fish and other freshwater prey items. They also help by drawing in oxygen from the water and expelling it as mud balls in the reptile's nasal cavity, allowing it to stay submerged much longer than it could otherwise. By reducing the reptile's need to move, the parasites have been able to provide a stable and defensive shelter where they can mass-produce offspring and implant their offspring on animals to brush by. So basically, all the people that live in this island and all the creatures that, lives, that live in these islands are subject to the parasite, apart from, apparently, from what they say, the French. But that's not true. With that said, I think it's time to finish our video. I have explored and told you about the continents of Min and Nevis, I have detailed the islands of Antilia, and I have explained the theology and the ideology of Holvenism, and of course went back to the lore of Europe, in the world beyond the ice walls. I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you will continue to support and watch the series as we travel to the lands of Avalon, the Hibermaitsog, and Athornia in the next video, and maybe even cover a number of the gates, but I'm not sure. So stick around and continue supporting the series to learn more about the world. Hope to see you in the next episode. Goodbye.